Psalm chapter 30, a psalm of David for the dedication of the temple. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his, praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. When I was a teenager, my favorite series of books, which I read multiple times, was The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper. It was a series of five modern-day fantasy novels in which a group of five children, aided by historical figures like Merlin and King Arthur, had to save the world from the forces of darkness which sought to control the affairs of humanity. Now, this series of books was completed in 1977, so hopefully I can tell you just a little bit about the ending of the series without spoiling it for anyone. In the final book, the five children, of course, succeed in their quest. Now, one of the five was required to continue on as a watchman to protect the world from future attacks of the darkness. 
But the other four, the other four had their memories of the entire events wiped, allowing them to live out normal lives in the world they had just rescued. I had never read a book that the ending of it affected me so deeply. I was used to reading books with happy endings, fully and completely happy. And while this book didn't exactly have a sad ending, I wouldn't describe it as fully happy either. My heart went out to those children who had their memories wiped of everything they had done. It was haunting. Later, I would learn a word that described the feeling I experienced when I got to the end of that book. The word was bittersweet. Bittersweet means pleasant, but tinged with elements of sadness, pain, or regret. Now, at the time I first read it, my experience of life was very simple. Everything was either happy or sad. The notion of carrying both of those emotions in my heart simultaneously was not something I'd ever really considered. But you know that it's true. It's possible to be simultaneously happy and sad, especially for example, if you've lost a loved one, you know that when memories of the one you loved come to the surface, they bring this strange mixture of happiness and sadness, laughter and tears. Holidays especially can be a dizzying emotional roller coaster. It's important for us to hang on to this idea that human emotions are complex and confusing and we can carry opposite emotions in our heart side by side at the same time. It's important because today we're talking about joy and most dictionaries describe joy as great happiness. Now, when you combine that with scripture verses like rejoice in the Lord always, a simplistic view leads us to end up with songs like I'm in right out right up right down right happy all the time or at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day the truth is these songs don't match our day-to-day -day experience of life in this mixed up, broken down world. We are not happy all the time or happy all the day. And furthermore, there's nothing in scripture that suggests we should be. Jesus himself said, blessed are those who mourn. All of this is my way of saying, as we explore the fruit of the spirit and consider today the fruit of joy, we need to toss out some simplistic understandings of both joy and human emotions because a simplistic understanding can lead us in some unhealthy directions. Our scripture reading this morning is Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 35. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. 
When Jesus found and called Levi, the tax collector, to be one of his disciples, Levi thought the equation, occasion was worthy of great celebration. It's easy to understand why. Tax collectors were very unpopular, even hated. And to have a great rabbi like Jesus say, I want you to come follow me and be with me, well, that would have been a moment of great excitement. Levi would say, finally, someone has accepted me. So Levi throws a great dinner party and invites the only people who would come to one of his parties, other outcasts. Tax collectors and sinners is how the Pharisees describe the guest list. The Pharisees are upset by this whole event and they launch a couple attacks. First, they complain to the disciples that Jesus is hanging out with sinners. Jesus responds with his famous statement that it is the sick who need a doctor. So when that attack fails, they launch a second one. This one is something we've talked about in our study of Galatians, comparing people to see who is the holiest. Did you notice, they asked Jesus, that our disciples and John's disciples often fast? But not your disciples, they just keep right on eating and drinking and living the good life. Now for the Pharisees, fasting was a sign of sadness, of mourning. Basically they're saying, your disciples aren't sad enough to suit us. In response, Jesus gives a scenario that they all would have been familiar with, and we're familiar with it as well, even though our traditions are very different. It was the scenario of a wedding. If you are married, do you remember the joy of that day, the excitement, the anticipation? And even if you're not married, do you remember that same sense when a dear friend got married? To watch a friend embark on a new phase of life with someone they love, that's a wonderful thing. So Jesus says, when a man is getting married, all of his friends are excited and celebrating. But what happens after the wedding? The friend's time, energy, and resources are taken up with beginning this new phase of life. The result is that the groom's friends now have their joy tempered with the sadness that things aren't the same anymore. And I'm sure you've experienced that as well. Someone goes through a significant life change, maybe a marriage, maybe a move, or the birth of a child, and suddenly nothing seems the same between you anymore. You may rejoice for your friend's great blessing, yet mourn over what you have lost. So what exactly is Jesus saying? What's his point? He's saying, my disciples have nothing to mourn over because I am here with them. A day will come when I will be taken from them. And on that day, they can mourn and fast all they want. But while I am with them, they rejoice and celebrate. He reiterates this idea later on the day he's arrested. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. In both passages, Jesus' message is loud and clear. I am the source of my disciples' joy. All around you, people find their joy in temporary pleasures, but the joy of the Christian is to be deeper than that. It is to be found in a twofold assurance that comes from Christ himself. The first is this, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus said this to his disciples just before being taken up into heaven at a time when it would seem to them that he was not with them anymore. He wants to assure them that his physical presence with them is not required in order for him to be near. Considering all that the disciples would face, imprisonment, exile, and even martyrdom, this promise from Jesus would help them keep going. When nothing went as they expected or wanted, when the world hated them, when everything was lost to them, there was one thing that kept their heads above water. Jesus was with them. The second assurance is this. If I go, I will come again 
and receive you unto myself. Not only is Christ near to us in spirit now, but also he will one day draw near to welcome us into our heavenly home. When Paul told the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord always and followed that up by saying the Lord is near, I found myself wondering, does he mean the Lord is near in spirit now or does he mean that the Lord's return is near? Then I realized both are true. We can rejoice because in the worst that this world throws at us, we know that Jesus suffers beside us and with us and we are never alone. We can also rejoice because the worst that this world can throw at us is only temporary. Jesus will come again, and all that suffering will end. Paul wrote in Philippians 3.10 that it is possible to be drawn into deeper fellowship with Christ through suffering. And in 2 Corinthians 4.17, he wrote that our light affliction in the present time is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Rejoice, not because you suffer, but because any suffering you face in this life brings you into deeper fellowship with Christ and his sufferings, and because they add to the glory you will experience in eternity. Now this does not mean that we go through life with smiles pasted on our faces and saying, now I am happy all the day. We must not lose sight of the fact that Jesus told us it is good to mourn and that he himself is known as the man of sorrows. In addition, we must not forget that we have been instructed not just to rejoice with those who rejoice, but also to weep with those who weep. We are complex beings capable of extraordinary ranges and mixtures of emotion. When a loved one passes, we experience the great joy that comes with memories of love and shared experiences and simultaneously experience the deep mourning and lamenting that comes from loss. There will be times in this life that you feel like you can barely keep your head above water. There will be times that you feel like you are drowning in tears and troubles. There will be times when you feel like one more straw will break your back, and there is no escape. Please do not feel guilty for feeling this way. It is what Christ felt when he stood before the grave of his friend Lazarus and wept. It is what he felt when he prayed in the garden before his crucifixion. This is the price we all pay for living in a troubled and broken world. And we see this throughout Scripture. In today's Scripture reading, we saw that weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. In Psalm chapter 43, which is a litany of David's troubles and griefs, David concludes his lament with these words, Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, and my God. I may be grieving now, David seems to be saying, but I can keep my head above water because of the hope that I will rejoice again someday. So joy in this way of thinking could be seen as the inner peace that comes with hope. In the book of Habakkuk, the prophet writes these words, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. No matter what is happening in this world, the sovereign God is with you and gives your life balance to walk even in the most unstable terrain. Jesus is near. Cling to him 
like you would cling to a life preserver. In Jesus and in the promise of his nearness, we find the joy that never leaves, even in the deepest sorrows. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, draw near to us in our sorrows. Join with our tears as we join in the fellowship of your suffering. Remind us each day, each moment, of your presence with us. And fill our hearts with the joy of our Lord. May we, like you, endure faithfully because of the joy that is set before us. Strengthen our hearts and make us fruitful in your joy and balanced in the unstable terrain of life. Amen. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that among before our father's throne we pour our heart and prayers our fears our hopes our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear when we asunder part it gives us inward pain but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to 